I'm Jack Cushwood Room Now. Welcome to the Lupus panel from ULAR 2022. I'm joined by my good friends in Room Now faculty, Dr. Catherine Dow and Dr. Yuz Yusuf. Folks, tell us where you're, you're calling in from. Dallas from my clinic, where you left me. <laughs> I left her, right. She's at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And Yuz, I didn't leave you. Where are you? Yeah, uh, in Leeds, United Kingdom at 11 p.m. at night. Oh, yeah. So it, we appreciate you sticking in there for us. Um, uh, and these two covered the meeting in great detail um, uh, and covered lupus. Uh, one of their, this is their sort of research interest, their career interest, and they're really good at it. And I want to first off commend both of you, um, Catherine doing it virtual and uh, Dr. Yusuf doing it live on site. You guys did a tremendous job um, as far as Twitter and writing and videos. I mean, you were just um, machines out there covering the meeting and you did a really fine job. I can't thank you enough for doing that. So we're going to ask the faculty to um, present some of their favorite abstracts on lupus. And let's start with uh, Dr. Dow. Okay, Jack, this is it. I am so excited about this. I read about it. I even wrote for Room Now this blog, CAR T cells. All right. So what in the world is CAR T cells? It's chimeric antigen receptor. So that's where the word CAR comes from. And they're T cells. They're basically genetic engineered cells targeting CD19. You know, they're, they're heat seeking missiles because when you're using all these other disease modifiers, you know, B cell depleters, you're leaving behind a lot of these activated B cells in inflamed tissue, lymphatic organs, they're hidden from you. Well, these missiles will seek out these cells and destroy them. So it was actually borrowed from the oncology world. And what they do is they actually do leukophoresis for the patients. And that's where they pulled out all the white cells. And then these cells undergo a lantiviral transduction so that then they can have the receptors to bind onto them to target the CD19. Well, the patient's own cells are depleted. They use like chemo, cyclophosphamide, fludarabine, and then they infuse the CAR T cells. And what's fabulous is that depletion is pretty rapid. The B cells, you know, pretty much go away like within nine days and as the CD19 cells expand. Um, and then after 100 days, the patient's new naive B cells comes in and takes over. So this is possibly a cure for lupus, but it does come with a cost, though. Do you know what the cost is? The cost on half a, life half a million or USD. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, use cost in US dollars. Yes, nearly half a million USD. That's right. It comes at a big cost. And there's also the possible side effects, you know, associated with it from the oncology world. Now, thankfully, the five patients that Dr. Um, Shet had presented had none of these complications, but these patients can actually have cytokine release syndromes, and they can also have um, neurotoxic syndromes associated with like inflammation that can be induced by the CAR T cells. But I'm really excited about this, really want to learn more about CAR T cells. I think this is possibly for patients who are really severe, life-threatening lupus, and we had no other, other options. Really excited. So these were patients who did fail everything. You know, they've all been on belimumab. They've all been on, you know, all the, all the biologics, all the, the DMARDs. They all had very severe disease um, and they all did well, meaning that they did clinically well. They're num numerically, they did well as far as the cell counts. Um, I got a lot of questions though. I, I was really encouraged by the lack of toxicity um, yeah. in this five patient um, sampling. Um, and that's all this can really be considered. Um, but why did they stop all their drugs? Why did they stop all their DMAR and biologic therapy going in, Catherine? Why did they stop? They their don't need it anymore. That was the beautiful thing. They are off all therapy. So, you know, Professor Shett was saying like, this is the cure. I don't know. I wouldn't call it a cure necessary right now until I can see longer term data. But the fact is, you know, these patients are off of medicines and they had two patients that they've now had um, follow up for almost a year. It's pretty they impressive. Did show the, they did show the CD19 cells coming back in two out of the five, at like it was around four or six months or something like that at low levels. So um, use, does this data excite you or, or worry you? So um, 
yeah, I think it excites us because potentially it may be useful for this the most severe resistance in patient. But then again, um, I don't think that we can be 100% optimistic about it because of, uh, as we know, lupus is heterogeneous in terms of immunopathogenesis. So I think, you know, if we're blocking the B cells, there's also this innate immunity as well that's happening. Um, so, you know, there's potentially that area as well that potentially we have, we have to target as well for prolonged remission. So. Yeah, you know, the um, I want to remind the, 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 the two of you what data that you well know, which is that um, the SYNBIO study, which was the first of the sequential rituximab followed by belimumab, 16 patients, horrible disease, failed everything. The data looked incredible, right? And uh, so there's a bit of a reporting bias in here. We wouldn't be hearing about this if they didn't do incredible. Um, but again, when these things are subjected to further study, uh, they don't always do quite as well. And that's a theme with all, the, all drug development, but I guess you have to be excited about um, this really dramatic effect. And like, you, like Catherine said, you know, bringing the technology that's worked so well in other disciplines to our um, most um, difficult patients is, it got, has to be encouraging. So um, all right, I think we all like that and put that at the top of our list. What was uh, high on your list, uh, Yus? Right, so I'm just gonna be uh, giving uh, some good news and bad news <laughs> from two trials. So I think uh, just in line with what uh, you said earlier, Jack, you know, regarding to whether these drugs, you know, initially is good in case series and whether would they do fair in clinical trials. Clinical trials uh, in lupus is nightmare. I mean, especially trying to find like the correct endpoint and also the, you know, comparator, how much steroid do you give? So essentially, so I'm going to, talk about the negative bit first, which is from uh, poster 0190. So this is a uh, data from two uh, phase three trials of baricitinib uh, in SLE. Uh, as we know, um, they have a good positive uh, phase two trials about three years ago presented. Um, and unfortunately, um, for the, so these, uh, these two BRAVE uh, study, BRAVE 1 and BRAVE 2, they're both identical design. Uh, and they use uh, SRI4, uh, which is uh, 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 response as a primary endpoint. Um, the SRI4 was met in the BRAVE 1 trial, however, not met in um, SRI uh, so and BRAVE 2 trial. And I think the, plus, the placebo response rate is quite high as well, it's about 45%. So, you know, it's a bit difficult there. So, um, then they look into in terms of like you know disease manifestation. So there's some signals there again in Brave One where there's uh, improvement in skin and joints in both uh, SRI and the bi like uh, you know uh, response. Uh, however, not in Brave Two. Um, then they look into you know the whole pictures however none of the key secondary endpoints were met so i think uh because of that uh, lily has you know uh, published and announced that they're not going to go proceed uh, with uh, for the development of baristinib in lupus which is uh, you know it's, it's quite a shame so that's the negative bit so um however <laughs> the promising but before you go the, on use hold yeah, on, yeah, on. yep yeah. i'm still i mean that breaks my heart I and I still, I still really don't want to give up on this drug. I mean, the problem with the trial was that over 75% of the, the study population were on pretty good doses of steroids. And even though steroid taper was encouraged, not everybody actually tapered their steroids. And so that's, that gave us like a really high placebo rate. Um, but the drug did show some good significance, particularly when it came to mucocutaneous disease and joint disease. So I mean, do you think that perhaps they were just choosing the wrong population to study this in? Yeah, sometimes that could happen. I think there's always a lot of discussion about selection of patient, but th these are antibody positive patients though as well. Um, like you say, it could just be the, the, the steroid problems, you know, how you know, you, you see that the Voclosporin trial in renal, I mean, we're talking about renal, not extra renal, in, you know, sort of lupus, and they were so brave, like, you know, getting steroid tapered down so quickly, and I got, got good results. So maybe, you know, <laughs> I think we probably have to be brave about the, you know, the, the choice of comparator here, so. To be brave about the brave studies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but right. if you were to listen to Eric Morin um, on his abstract, the pre-recorded abstract, do you know what his conclusion said? I don't know if you listened to it. 
He said yeah, it's yeah. inconclusive whether or not baricitinib works. <laughs> inconclusive. Yeah. So that leaves the door open. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a lupus trial cliffhanger. And yes. uh, maybe maybe there'll be another life after this. But not all JAK inhibitors are equal. And you su- use what's the other JAK inhibitor trial in lupus that you want to talk about? Yeah, so it's a you know that, that was a bit of gloom. So now we're going to be more but more excited about things. So um, we do have a positive uh, phase two trials uh, in lupus. Um, so this time um, is a molecule, uh, so, so a drug called ducravacitinib. I always find it difficult to pronounce it. Um, so it was presented at a late breaking abstract. So LB treble uh, zero four. Um, so this is the um, so. Ducravacitinib is a molecule, it's a, a selective uh, tick uh, one, a, a tick inhibitors. So basically, um, the uh, so the two, yeah, no, so this uh, targeting um, the common pathogenesis for SLE, which is the TAC1 interferons, IL-12 and IL-23. So it is quite selective of that. Um, so there, there are three doses of the drug that we're looking into, the three milligram, six milligram, and 12 milligram against placebo. And again, they use the SRI4 as the uh, primary endpoint. Uh, and uh, the dose for three and six milligram was statistically tass- significant, uh, really high compared to the placebo. And the placebo rates uh, in this trial, about 35%. So it's like 10% lower than the parasitic in its trial earlier. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, and there is no major safety concern there. So I think this is really promising uh, and they are actually moving forward to phase three trials. And I think we're just uh, going to try to watch the space. So yeah, I think one thing that, I, that the thing that I'm, like struck me as well is they're actually targeting the IL-12 and IL-23. And you could see that like, they've actually got a quite higher proportion of patients as well who have a cutaneous response. As we know, a couple of years ago, the Ustekinumab had a similar phase two pos- uh, positive phase two trial as well. Um, and Ustekinumab is IL-12 and IL-23 inhibitors. So I think maybe you know, so, so this will be quite good for the skin disease, joint disease, and et cetera, for lupus. So the interesting thing about this study, of course, was that the safety was good. You know, it's a tick is part of the Jack family. Um, and were they going to have the same um, Jack inhibitor um, disastrous side effects, and gen- the answer, answer was no in these trials and not in their other trials for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Um, but again, we're still in drug development, so it remains to be seen. Um, the, I'm really the, impressed with the data. I mean, if this drug is out now, I would totally write the prescription. <laughs> after phase two trial, that's a little it, uh, yeah, that's but a it's little just so impressive. Like everything I, I looks mean, good I'm in excited phase two, about this. and then phase three doesn't always look as good. Again, and the other thing about this was that there was no dose response. You're such a glass half empty, Jack. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I'm looking for half full. But again, only the three milligram BID group gave you the highest response. The the 12 milligram once a day or 12 milligram twice, it whatever plateaus. it was. It plateaus. We see the plateau all the time. No, it was actually not plateau. It was going down. Um, but but anyway, we know now the dose that they'll use. It'll be six milligrams either once a day or, or three BID that seems like it's probably going to be the dose. It is encouraging data. Um, but again, big data that you need for FDA approval is going to come in phase three. And a lot of lupus drugs have not done well in phase three, unless they were organ specific indications. So, you know, so studying nephritis has seemed to have been a better um, endpoint than trying to go after SRI4 and sleet eye outcomes in just global lupus patients that might, while I think companies want that indication, um, it's a much harder bar to actually achieve. I think one of the challenges that they're going to have for phase three is actually trying to recruit a diverse population. I think that BMS is going to, you know, really try to make sure that they include like a lot of um, people from different ethnicities and backgrounds. So um, that's going to be a big challenge. But I, I am going to be looking forward to seeing what happens with this drug. So let me give you uh, mine, and we need to go faster on the ones we're going to present next. But mine is um, infection drives lupus flares, um, oral presentation OP0138. Um, this was a um, study also from the BioBadasser uh, registry, um, biologics use, I guess, um, 
that doesn't seem right but it was a it was a registry and what they did was they they defined minor infections and that's colds and utis and major infections that were hospitalized infections largely uh, what we would normally call serious infectious events um, and they looked at those rates in a group of patients followed i think it was for a number of years i want to say almost six years um, at least 18 months and the serious infection rate was five per 100 patient years in these lupus patients um, and the non-serious infection rate, something Catherine and I have written about, was 63.9, I think, per 100, meaning everybody gets a non-serious infection. And, um, and what they did show was that overall, lupus patients who had infections had a two-fold increased risk of a flare, and they had minor flares and major flares. And the scary data was that if you had a major SIE, serious infectious event, you were likely to have a flare, a serious flare, and you are at a sevenfold higher risk for serious flares, suggesting that these things go hand in hand. And I don't think this isn't surprising to anyone who manages patients and sees that their disease gets better when they get sick with other incidental infections or whatever. But um, it's good to have a number on it and to know that, you know, if you want to get your patients you know, keep them flare free, you got to manage uh, infections probably pretty aggressively and not leave it to the patient or their primary care. Um, yeah. And but, one of the strongest um, ways to prevent infection is actually through vaccinations. And that's why I've been such a huge proponent for vaccinations. Really important in lupus. And again, we're not going to go into it here, but data pre presented previously and at this meeting say that rheumatologists are not so good at doing vaccinations. The good news is you're not any worse than internists because um, we're all busy and seeing patients and turning them over and getting through the day. It takes time to, to cajole and to convince and to hear the patient concerns you know, about vaccination, whether it be for COVID or influenza or um, you know, pneumococcal. But I think that these are things that we really do need to work at because if not you, then who? All right. Um, Catherine, your next one. Okay, so I want to present poster 0184. So this is BIBO59. It's a new molecule. It's a new therapeutic, particularly looking at cutaneous lupus for this abstract. Now, it's been studied and presented um, for regular lupus, and it's shown some favorable profiles. But, you know, cutaneous lupus is something that we know lupus patients have, but kind of overlooked, like we don't really talk about it that much in rheumatology meetings. And we know that anti-malarials only work about 50% of the time. So this compound is really interesting because it's a humanized monoclonal antibody that binds to blood dendritic cell antigen 2, BDCA2, which is a receptor on plasma cytoid dendritic cells. So in the LILAC phase two study, um, this is a medicine that they would inject uh, 50 milligrams, 150 milligrams, 450 milligrams for placebo every four weeks for 16 weeks. And they found that the proportion of patients who achieve clear or almost clear skin defined by class A scores were much higher in the BIBO59. I wish they would give the drug a name. <laughs> Yeah. But this is actually a really promising drug for lupus patients, for skin, particularly those with cutaneous disease. So, so I think it's pretty innovative, very exciting, something to look forward to. I mean, in fact, all of ULARD, there's been a lot of compounds that it's like, wow. I mean, the field of lupus is definitely alive. There's so many new research being done in this field. And I'm so excited about it. But BIIB059. Just, just call it a PDC inhibitor. And I think that would be um, all, all you need to do. And of course, you know, inhibiting PDCs is, uh, is important in down regulating alpha interferon uh, and also B cell activation. And that's probably, you know, a smart way of, of controlling the disease. I just worry about what the untoward effects are of this administration on, you know, what happens when you give it to large numbers of people. I think it was brilliant that they use the skin outcome in cutaneous lupus, where you have a well-defined tool in the classy and the classy 50 to de define a good skin response. Uh, it's a smarter way of going. And I think it's got less noise than you would if you were going after an SRI four and a general lupus improvement. Cause if you show improvement in, in your endpoint, if you make yet, skin your endpoint 
you can look at other domains um, and as secondary endpoints and show how that works. So the design of this was smart. The results were encouraging. Use what did you think? Yeah, so uh, yeah, like uh, I echo some of the same thing. So I think it would be quite promising in particular to treat the skin lupus. And I think the, the, the results quite good in terms of, I think there's quite a lot of proportion patients who achieve like near clear as well. I think I think that's something that you know, is quite promising. Um, and But then again, just trying to, um, you know, uh, continue what you said, uh, Jack. So um, yeah, so the class C 50 is like 50 reduction of class C, but I think one other thing that we need probably need to think as well, maybe like we probably have to also adjust for baseline because like, obviously if you start really high, then your, you know, 50% is, you know, it's easier to, to reach, isn't it? So I think that's something maybe like we need to you know, look into that as well to read that. Okay. Use what's your next uh, favorite from the yeah, so um, again, they're from the late breaking abstract. So we got two actually from Lupus, uh, you know, uh, out of the eight sessions. So I think that's quite exciting when I was sitting, <laughs> sitting down there. Um, so the next one is LB0005. Um, so this is a little bit early on study. So it's actually phase 1B stroke 2A randomized control trials. Um, so this uh, looking uh, at um, a new uh, a therapy called um, Aurela Brutinib. Uh, which is a BTK inhibitor. So as we know, so BTK inhibitor um, in China, they've got license uh, uh, approved to treat a B cell uh, malignancies. So I think, um, so another, another pathway that we can block in lupus. So um, what they look at in the beginning is just look whether uh, occupancy. So they said in all the doses that they look into, um, so they, you know, it seems that the BTK the occupy, you know, occupied the all doses. Uh, however, in terms of clinical wise, um, the, you know, the number is quite small. So I think it's a bit difficult to assess like full efficacy. I think it just, this is trying to mainly focusing on safety, but also to see but they have, have they got any trend in terms of improvement? So they look into the SRA four. So all doses uh, achieves uh, 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 you know quite a lot in you know, a proportion higher compared to the placebo. Uh, and also they look into a serological parameter in terms of antibody and complements. So they're all looking like you know it's it's showing good trends. But like I said, I mean that there's only about eight, you know about eighty people uh, in it. So I think it's still a bit uh, early phase. Um, and they reported no major safety signals so i think it'll be quite interesting uh, to see so i think after this they're going to have to do a more like a definitive study of a bigger you know in phase two and then you know possibly phase three after that depending on the results so yeah so this was done in china the no the numbers were were low yeah the data looked really good um mm. my, my concern is that um btk inhibitors haven't failed fared very well uh in um, and being used in RA and other indications. So um, I, I, I really am anxious to see more studies to see if they can actually uh, reproduce these results. Kat, what did you think of the data? Um, it's early preliminary. I'm holding my breath. You know, the one thing that was a little bit worrisome to me was the mild to moderate lymphocyte counts being a lot lower. Um, mm -hmm. particularly in patients on the higher doses of medicines. I mean, some of our lupus patients already have a lot of leukopenia and lymphopenia. And so if it drops from 2000 down to 1000, I mean, it's this drug effect or is this lupus? We always can't really tell necessarily, but I mean, yes, I, I agree with you. It looks like there's a reduction in proteinuria, there's a reduction in their double strand DNA improvement in complements, and really not a lot of other side effects that they're seeing. So something to look at. Um, I'm not jumping up and down like I am with CAR T cells, with ducravacitinib <laughs> or plasma dendritic cell therapy. Well, you, <laughs> I'm not doing you your cartwheel to... as well. <laughs> Right, you have to reserve your cartwheels for just a few things, and what's better than for a CAR T cell? So, That's right. um, do do either of you have a quickie that you want to do before yes. we close? You know, I always do, and we can't end this without talking about sperm, Jack. <laughs> oh, that, well, you and I are going to sign off right now. Um, so, <laughs> I thought I'd like to present one more as well, actually. For my, my okay, so I'll, I'll let him go first. All right. Okay. Um, uh, a hot topic. So, so this is so important and we have to talk about it. We got to talk about sperm because, you know, like the American College of Rheumatology put out in 2020, the reproductive guidelines. 
And it says that men can stay on methotrexate when they're trying to get their partners pregnant. So there wasn't a lot of proof and ULAR never said anything. It's actually going against FDA guidelines. So like, what is it? So this is a study and they did, did such a beautiful study about it. So they took men who are about to start methotrexate. And basically what they did was they collected sperm samples before they started methotrexate and then sperm samples about four to six weeks after they started methotrexate and compared them. So what they found was there's really not a difference in semen volume, in the number of sperm, um, sperm motility. I mean, it all looks good. Now, the one difference they did see is DNA fragmentation. They found that before methotrexate, DNA fragmentation was much higher compared to after methotrexate. So this is actually interesting because we know that patients who have high disease activity actually can have higher rates of infertility. And so it would make sense that once you treat the inflammation, the sperm quality might actually be better. So I, and, and it's also proof that yes, men can take methotrexate when trying to help their partners to conceive. It's yeah. so important. And that's, uh, it certainly does back up what's been put forward in the ACR reproductive health guidelines, as far as advising men um, who want to uh, father uh, a, a child in the future and what their drug therapy should be, meaning that they can almost be on anything. Um, uh, and uh, and that, that it's a, a low risk for um, an unfavorable pregnancy outcome. So use what's your, your quickie. Yeah, so I'm just gonna bring back to the patient to close it up. Um, I thought this presentation was, uh, you know, it's really good and slick, and I find it's quite amazing when I when I listen to it. Um, so it's um, OP0141. So essentially, um, Dr. Johanna uh, Muck actually presented um, uh, data from a survey of over 800 patients with lupus. So the, the question that they want to ask really is trying to understand, um, you know, how you know how much the patient understand about the treatment to targets. Uh, and also, um, you know, what is it important and are they involved? I think that's what the question that they wanted to ask. Um, so uh, in terms of the survey itself, so they found that, you know, the two top things uh, on the list, what's important to the patient was um, improvement in quality of life, uh, followed by uh, prevention of organ damage. So I think you know, that, that's quite good for us you know, as a clinician to know that as well. Um, in terms of, um, you know, how much they were involved, so 61% people felt they somewhat or all the way involved in the decision making when you're setting a target with the patients. However, about one out of five patients felt that they hardly involved at all. So it's quite a lot. So in you know, 20% of patients felt that. Um, the, you know, to move forward, they didn't even ask whether if we were to implement, like, you know, treat the targets in the clinic, because uh, as we know, uh, there's quite a few targets that we can use. We could use the 2021 remi Doris remission, or we could use the LL DAS. So, you know, whether they be open to it, receptive to it, and, and, and majority of patients actually say they will be receptive to it, uh, and also to participate in the treat to target kind of type of studies. Um, the only two that are worry slightly is like they, they, they might worry that like if we were to imply the treat to, uh, treatment to target, it may mean like more clinic visits, which is, you know, quite, quite burdensome, uh, and also potentially if you want to really get the type of control of disease, then you may want to introduce more new therapy, so they may get a bit more anxious about the potential side effect and thing. I thought probably you know, quite interesting. I think it does show there is some disparity between the patient, what patient wants and what clinician wants. I think we, we need to all, you know, get this like 20%, you know, not involvement to get all closer so that we can achieve the same target. You said they make an attempt to correlate um, those that were less likely to be interested in treat the target or less, less likely to be involved with actual outcomes? So they've not they've not um, presented that on, on the data, but it'll be something interesting to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Along these lines, this is basically it's a, a big issue for me, which is get better patients. But we can't just get better patients. We have to make better patients. And it really is up to you. And I think I've learned that from working with Catherine, um, that, you know, if you spend the time with the patients and, make, and get their trust, you can then make them into better patients. But you have to have a plan. What I don't know is I don't have a plan to identify those that are not going to be involved and, you know, may not be compliant. And, and, that, and that's something that we unfortunately learn when it's too late. 
Took me 20 years to try and make you who you are, Jack. So, <laughs> it's still a work in progress. Is all, I can say. So, all right, folks. Thank you so much for these great insights. Um, to everyone, tune in for more great videos on Room Now. Hope you enjoyed. Bye. Good night.